The Databases for Machine Learning and Machine Learning for Databases seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Google and from contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome. It's the last talk of the semester. We're excited today to have uh, to finish things off with uh, the guys from Chroma. So Hamad and Lee Kwan are from the founding team of Chroma, and it's another vector database. They're here to talk about what makes them special, what makes them different. So as always, if you have any questions for the Chroma guys as they're giving a talk, please unmute yourself and say who you are, and feel free to do this anytime. That way they're not talking to themselves for an hour on Zoom. So with that, uh, Hamad and Lee Kwan, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Go for it. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. And thanks to the course staff for putting this on. This is definitely something I wish existed when I was in school. It's cool to hear from everyone, and it's been really fun. I've been following along with the course uh, throughout the semester and watching everyone's talks. So hopefully today, we're, you know, we're going to talk about Chroma. Hopefully it won't be too much that you've already seen in other talks. Um, we'll, we'll keep it interesting and, and talk a little bit about what we think is our unique perspective on vector databases and specifically our unique perspective on what's needed to build a end-to-end -end retrieval system for large language models. So um before i start i'll just talk a little bit about oh, here we go talk a little bit about chroma so the project itself was launched uh, in february of this year uh, it's been a tremendous year for ai i know it's like peak of the hype cycle right now but uh, we've had roughly uh, you know uh, 850,000 uh, downloads just on pypy alone per month and we're seeing like a million machines running chroma per month we've had you know been used in over 12,000 github projects and it's been really cool to engage with the open source community there's like 80 you know, full-time contributors that are helping us a lot with like small nits and fixes, giving us feedback and a core team of, of five and, and soon to be six, seven people. Um, and I think when you think about retrieval, it's really important. And when you think about vector databases in the context of language models, it's important to think somewhat about language models themselves. So I'll start with the basics, right? What is a language model? Uh, and naively, we can, you know, look at it this way, which is we have some query or some question and we get out some answers, really naive uh, perspective of a language model, but uh, hopefully one that makes sense to everyone. But by now, you've probably used things like ChatGPT or, or plenty of the open source models. And, uh, you know, you get some question and, and you get some answer. And really what this looks like, right, we might ask the language model, hey, what is relational algebra? And perhaps, perhaps the language model has been trained on uh, Wikipedia and so it regurgitates to us the definition that we uh, might see if we search relational algebra on Wikipedia, which is a theory that uses algebraic structures for modeling data and defining queries on it with well-founded semantics. Um, but what does the language model actually do when we ask it this question? What it does first off is it takes your, your text and it tokenizes it. There's various tokenization schemes, um, but all of them basically amount to, you have some fixed set of tokens, some N thousand potential tokens that you can turn your text into. And quite literally, we just get a an array of, of integers. That's that's what we turn the text into. And we pass that into a language model. And it tells us the probability for all possible tokens that we've you know trained the model on, what is the, the pro probability that we might generate the next one. And we do this repeatedly in an autoregressive fashion, generating the entire string. Um, and this is important to understand because if you do something in this way, you're gonna, you're gonna be quite prone to potentially generating the wrong piece of information. Um, so a huge problem with language models is that they quote, store knowledge in their parameters, right? It's this parametrically trained system. Uh, we have, you know, a potentially deep nested sequence of transformer encoders or decoders, and we are creating um, a, a language model that learns the probability of certain strings, but there's some problems with that, right? We can't update them in real time. We can't update them deterministically. Uh, we can't provide provenance for their knowledge. So how do we get a language model to tell us where did you get this information from? And also they have a tendency to hallucinate. Because they're just modeling language, they're predicting the next most likely token. While they do, you know, people argue whether or not these things are learning world models. We can debate that separately. Uh, please email me if you're curious about these things. I find them fascinating. Um, but some people, you know, will talk about how they have a tendency to hallucinate. Um, because they are just predicting the next token, we are just always going to blindly sample the next most likely token in the most naive decoding scheme for a language model. So a, a, ta a technique that many people have been using is what's called retrieval augmented generation. And the idea is pretty simple. You combine parametric and non-parametric memory. Um, and this comes from a paper from Patrick Lewis and team at FAIR, I think like two years ago. And the idea is pretty simple. As opposed to just taking some text and giving it to a language model, can we now take some text, give it to a language model in addition to some documents that might help ground the language model's generation to generate some output Y? And more concretely, what this looks like is we have some corpus of documents. We basically we try and figure out some scheme to help us select some subset of documents. We literally 
can attach that to the input text for the language model, rerun our generation scheme, and get some output text wide. And there's a couple of different decoding schemes for this, right? In the most naive decoding scheme, what we might do is generate the entire sequence full shot with all of the all of the documents attached to the prompt. So if you're asking the language model, what is relational algebra? Perhaps you might give it some sequences that seem relevant to answering that question. Um, and then you just have it one shot generate. In another approach, you might actually attach one of the documents and do many runs of the language model in parallel and then compute the marginal probabilities across all of those. In another scheme, you might even do this lookup per token. Uh, the point I'm trying to elucidate here is that there's many different small variations to the same strategy and developers often struggle with this. Which one do I use? Which one will work best? Uh, how do I reason about what's better for my specific use case? How do I try them in real time or online and evaluate the differences? And these are all problems that Chroma hopes to solve one day. Um, and specifically the way that we actually do this retrieval step, this problem of I have some set of documents and I wanna, wanna get it. The technique that most people have been using is to, to use dense vector similarity search. So the basic idea is, and I'm sure you're familiar, we use some sort of dense encoding model, usually a learned model. Um, when we map text passages to vectors, then we perform similarity search, which is usually just you know raw k nearest neighbor search for a given query. Similarity can be any metric in this case for, for the paper that I'm, I'm citing here. Um, it was the inner product, uh, which was like actually they trained a uh, an embedding model on, on the inner product. And what you can quickly see is compared to like a naive ranking, not naive, but compared to a, a scalar ranking scheme like BM25, instantly the accuracy on many retrieval data sets jumps quite a bit. So for example, natural questions, which is like a retrieval benchmark, um, which I think highlights spans of Wikipedia based on human annotations, we see that really quickly the learned embedding model performs a lot better even after only exposed to a thousand training samples. And after we expose it to all of the training samples, it performs um, about like 20% better. Um, and if you're curious, you can, you can read more in the paper. But the point here I'm trying to make is that by using uh, dense similarity search, you can get much more accurate and contextual documents for the problem you're trying to solve at any given moment. And what this actually looks like concretely is you input some documents D1 through D and then you chunk these into small chunks, right? So the embedding model has some fixed window that it can actually take some piece of text and turn it into an actual embedding. Then we take each chunk and tokenize and embed it. Um, and then we actually, because if you remember in the previous slide, sometimes it's actually useful to combine like traditional, you know, BM25 ranking with vector ranking. So you might want to index them in a, in a scalar fashion. So perhaps you want to build a full text search index over the documents, or perhaps you want to build some other sort of ranking index um, over the scalar components of your document. Uh, and then we actually take each chunk and we index its vector component. Uh, and then afterwards, you might query these using the vector index and maybe you apply some re-ranking um, using a learned re-ranking model. But this is generally the pipeline that people follow from raw document all the way through to retrieve results, right? It's a combination of many different pieces, each with their own heuristic knobs and relevant strategies. And tuning these is where developers spend a huge proportion of their time and run into a huge number of potential pitfalls. And so our perspective on this is that there should be tools in the market that exist for people to not have to think about these individual pieces in isolation to build each system in isolation, but end to end systems that help you do all of these uh, together in an easy way and to iterate on the system as a whole slowly over time, um, as opposed to having to take each problem, decompose it into its own respective system and put them together manually. Um, so there's a couple use cases for this retrieval workflow that have been emerging for the last year or so. The first is dialogue. So we've all used ChatGPT by now. And you might just have some additional data that you put into the context of ChatGPT. You want to have some dialogue with the model, but also you want to give you want to give the model access to personalized or private data. Um, and so this data corpus is you know something that is personal to the specific user in mind or personal to the specific team that is using the product. And another use case is the one of agents. So this is more new and emerging, but one that we're pretty excited about. But the idea is you either have autonomous or somewhat managed agents that interact with external services and systems. So one thing that uh, is, is like a small like example, perhaps you might have some sort of system that manages your DevOps for you, right? You have an agent that understands your AWS setup. You can just say, hey, I want to set up CI CD for this workflow. It just goes and does that because it knows how to look at your system. And then it stores the skills it learns in a vector database. And so this pattern of storing learned knowledge storing learned experience and learned skills in a vector database is one that has been more recently started to become studied. A paper that we've uh, been excited about is called Voyager. It happened to use Chroma, uh, where they basically train a Minecraft agent 
to play the game of Minecraft and it stores its learned skills inside of uh, inside of a vector database. Um, and another one is auto completion or predictive AI, um, which is basically like if you're doing the, the the most I think relatable example for this audience would be imagine like uh, GitHub Copilot. So you're writing code and we're able to like predictively fetch the right pieces of documents, uh, the right pieces of code in order to help ground the language models generation uh, based on what you're seeing. So if you're writing some code, it might be useful to fetch similar code to the, the code that you're writing to help give the language model a few shot prediction of what code it should suggest that uh, you should write. Um, and these use cases in, entail a very specific workload shape. And I think the argument I'll make is that this workload shape is rather different than I think what vector indices were originally created for and what the vector search research, uh, I think traditionally focused on, which was very large scale, very high throughput uh, data sets. And usually it was one index, you built it offline, you updated in batch. And this workload's rather different. We have a data set where the QPS is relatively marginal, right? Like we're not shooting for one index that has a very high uh, queries per second. Most of our customers are okay with, you know, 100 to 1,000 QPS on a given index. Um, but the data is also very real time. It's not updated in batch. And so the data lag that they're willing to tolerate is somewhere in the order of 100 milliseconds. And their data scale is fundamentally relatively moderate. So their data scale is on the order of one to 100 million vectors. We're not dealing with data sets, you know, a, a personalized data set for a chat dialogue bot. It doesn't have uh, many billions of embeddings. It has somewhere on the order of one to 100 million embeddings. But these embeddings might be frequently updated and deleted. So you might take, for example, the case of a document editing uh, you know, software, and it needs to be able to frequently update and delete pieces of documents as users are editing them so that an a agent that is working with you in order to like suggest what you may or may not want to write is able to respond to the updates and deletes in the document. But I think the most, I think to me, the most large difference is the one of the index, uh, the number of indexes alone in any given data system. So you might actually end up having a index per user. And so you might have on the order of like a hundred million indices um, for a, you know, a reasonable workload uh, at, at many companies. And you want a very high recall target out of these because you're conditioning a language model to generation. And it's been shown that language models are quite poor at ignoring data that they don't understand to not be related to the task they're trying to perform. So it's very important and we can't really tolerate, uh, you know, deviance and recall. And one thing that I think is also pretty different is the, uh, because of the cursor dimensionality, the vectors that we're dealing with are quite large. Um, they're, they're, if you go look at a lot of the literature on uh, vector indices, the, the dead dimensions of the vectors tend to be quite small. So they're 96 to 120 dimensions. And these are most of the benchmarks you'll see in most of the papers that have been put out in the vector database world. But the vectors that we deal with are, are much larger than that. And this actually makes a really big difference when, when you're actually doing the number of distance comparisons that you end up doing when searching vector indices. So the dimensionality we deal with is on the order of somewhere between 768 to 4096 dimensions, which is much, much larger than um, you know, traditional sparse and sparse vectors, or sorry, much larger than um, d the dense vectors you saw from uh, uh, from vector search in, in older workloads. And and what usually what people do right is you use some sort of uh, approximate nearest neighbors index to deal with the fact that you can't end up exhaustively searching the whole solution space. And broadly, there's two classes of algorithms that are used. The first is uh, inverted indices. So the idea here is you create some centroids over your data and you assign data points to a given centroid. Usually this is used in conjunction with some sort of compression scheme, usually product quantization. So you're compressing the individual points um, and then you're assigning them to a given centroid. Um, all of them, is, all, all of these algorithms are basically trying to reduce the number of distance comparisons you're doing by, by, by pruning the search space that is illegible to you. Um, the other commonly used um, algorithm class is a proximity graph. I'm sure you've seen from, from other people in industry, which is we create a graph uh, expressing neighbor relationships. These are often approximating a DLNA or relative neighborhood graph. Um, these are like sort of the inspiration and the sort of mathematical intuition you can have there is that the DLNA, the DLNA is a dual to the Voronoi and the Voronoi obviously is a good uh, tool for dividing up space. Um, and then the relative neighborhood graph is closely related to the DLNA. Uh, triangulation of any set of points. And so that also, also gives us some intuition for how to think about why a proximity graph where any point is connected to nodes in its local region might be useful as a way to divide up space and search through it. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about inverted indices, which are a commonly used index type in industry. And what I'd like to do is walk through inverted indices, 
and walk through commonly used proximity graphs and sort of talk about why they're not the best fit for the workload that we're targeting. And then I'll talk a little bit about what exactly we're doing and how it's how it's somewhat different. So traditionally, when people use inverted indices, they do so with product quantization. So the the classic workflow is you take your chunks of documents that we discussed earlier, they're of D dimensionality, we run some sort of clustering algorithm called k-means, uh, and we'll, we'll end up with some list of centroids. And then what we do is we quantize our chunks. So we take our chunks, they're d-dimensional, we do some sort of quantization, perhaps, you know, uh, we, we divide them into six subspaces, and, and we get a dimensionality reduction of six. And then what we do is we take all of our chunks and we assign them to the closest centroids. Um, we then find at query time, we find the closest n centroids. So you have some query, you find your closest centroids, and we compute the distance to the assigned centroids. Uh, and that's how we know which posting list to actually search. Uh, and then we can re-rank because the, the quantization step actually reduces the precision of our um, comparisons uh, for each posting list by quite a bit. So we recompute the full precision distance for each final list. And so this is a very commonly used approach. Uh, one of the problems with it is it ends up suffering a lot from recall. Uh, the recall suffers quite a bit. You don't get the answers as high as accurately as you'd want. So what people end up doing is they way over query their index by an order of 100 to sometimes 1,000x and then re-rank that list. And if you just actually do the measurement on the number of uh, distance comparisons you end up doing, there, it, it begs the question of like, are there things we could be doing that perhaps might be slightly better? And other people have found these techniques. But Mika, um, when you say when you say way over query, you just mean like limit a thousand. Yes. Okay. So Matt, like they want ten, they'll do a limit a thousand. Yeah, like sometimes a hundred to a thousand x the number that okay. they want to actually retrieve. Yeah. All so right. they just set okay. k quite high. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and so the other vector index that's commonly used uh, is a proximity graph algorithm um, called HNSW or hierarchical navigable small worlds. Uh, this is um, work from. Yuri Makov and Dmitry Yashunin. Um, and um, the idea is really, really simple and, and really elegant. The idea is, can you actually just build a traditional proximity graph? So you have some graph and without getting too much into the details, because what really matters for our conversation today is that it is a graph and graphs are poor, poorly stored on disk um, oftentimes. And so because it is a graph, what they do is they build a proximity graph and they, they inspired by skip lists, they build layers in this graph. So the top layer of the graph has longest range connections. The bottom of the graph has smaller and smaller connections. And the way you can think of this is that the diameter or the radius of your graph is shrinking as you go down the number of hops from uh, any one node to the furthest node uh, is decreasing. And uh, the other trick that they employ in addition to doing this hierarchy of graphs, which makes the search go from, you know, a Poly polynomial time to logarithmic time is they have this heuristic, which I think is really important to pay attention to, which is oftentimes you end up as you're building proximity graphs, you end up with points that are on the edge between two clusters. And so they have a heuristic that will encourage cross cluster connections. And this, this sort of problem comes up a lot when you're partitioning space. Um, and is also like, we'll talk a little bit later about how the same heuristic you can apply to inverted indices and end up with something that's a little bit better than the traditional inverted index approach. But the key thing here for our, for our conversation, even if you don't understand how HNSW works at all, is that it's a graph. And graphs are not that great to be stored on disk. The access pattern is really random. Uh, and people have done work, for example, on disk and then where you can build the graph in such a way that it's more amenable on disk. But at the end of the day, these things are really hard to reason about. Um, the fundamental access pattern of a graph is very random. Your, and the graph is actually designed to have long range connections to move all over the, the data. And if you actually just looked at the page access, if you divided your graph into some, some number of pages and you looked at the page access across the graph, you end up touching a large, large percentage of the graph um, in terms of the number of pages you touch when you do a query. And the problem with this, so what people do is they store the entire graph in memory. And that quickly becomes a bottleneck, both from a cost perspective, but also just from a, um, a usability perspective. Like, how do you think about deploying something when everything that you have to touch will always live in memory? Um, and then another problem with HNSW is because of its design, deletes tend to degrade the graph. And the, the like commonly used solution for this is you just end up rebuilding the HNSW index entirely. So let's say 20% of the graph gets deleted, we'll just entirely rebuild it. Um, and then inverted indices also have their own set of problems. Um, the the k-means clustering step often poorly partitions the space, and so you suffer from low recall. It's also very hard to think about how many centroids to search. 
And then it's often used in conjunction with PQ. And then this has this over querying problem that I mentioned. And this is very hard for people to think about in terms of tuning. Every different queries might have a different number of probes, a different number of centroid lists that you actually want to search. And also if you have real-time data, which is quite important to us, when you do the centroid step, your data can drift quite a bit, right? If you are indexing data over time, the centroids have to be a, a representation of the distribution of the data at all times, but you are only building these centroids uh, a piece at a time. And that's gonna lead to drift in your actual centroid cluster instead, which makes the inverted index have poorer recall over time. Um, so there's some interesting work done at Microsoft um, about two years ago, and they, they've made this algorithm called SPAN, um, where they, they take the idea and of how can we combine these two approaches, which is we store the centroids in a graph in memory, and then we, we keep the posting lists on disk. So we do our centroid search, but we don't do brute force over the centroids. We store them in an approximate nearest neighbors algorithm, and then we store the actual posting list on disk. And what's interesting here is they keep a very high centroid count. So 10 to 20% of the data is actually put into centroids. So if you had a million scale data set, you would have 100,000 centroids. This actually saves you a lot of memory and lets you, you know, push a lot of the workload to disk. But also what happens is um, now you have a very fast layer in memory and you can keep your lists very small. And when you can keep your list very small because you have a very high centroid count, it's very easy to reason about the disk access pattern because you know exactly how many are going to be accessed. You can plan your IOs really well and you can fetch these, these posting lists um, off disk quite effectively. Um, and then uh, what they do is the, the other tricks that they employ, and I, you'll, I, you'll recall that I mentioned this notion of you know points on a boundary. So what you can do is you can assign points to multiple centroids. They call this closure clustering. The idea is really simple. If you're assigning a point to a centroid, when you when you actually do assign it, only assign it to another point if its distance to that point is less than the distance to the closest point plus some epsilon. So we only want to attach uh, a point to another point if we feel we will attach a point to multiple centroids if we feel like it might be on the boundary between multiple centroid clusters. And then we also follow relative neighborhood graph rule for centroid assignment. So we don't want to over populate all of our centroid lists if a point over is overly specified on a boundary. So what we do is we say we're going to skip assigning a point to a cluster if the distance between that point and the cluster is greater than the point, the distance between that point and the, the between the two clusters. So in this diagram here, right, we have um, this orange point. It's being assigned to potentially this bottom left cluster and this bottom uh, right cluster. And we don't actually assign it to this bottom left cluster because the distance between the two clusters, the cluster it's already been assigned to, is less than the distance between this point and the cluster itself. And that means that the clusters probably overlap. And so at query time, when we go to look up a point in this region, we're probably going to end up looking in this list and this list anyways. So it doesn't make any sense to store this point twice. Really simple rule, but if you actually go do the, the quick analysis of how many lookups it saves you, it's quite a bit. And then the last thing they do is they observe that when you query, not all points need to visit the same number of centroids. So they apply the same pruning rule we applied for building the centroids, for assigning points to centroids. So they apply it at query time. And the observation is that different queries only need to access a different number of different number of centroids. And so you can actually prune the centroids when you're doing the query using the same distance rule. We won't query a point unless we find that the centroid that we want, the other centroid that we want to query is within some epsilon of us and the centroid that is closest to the point. And this, these three tricks make a huge difference in terms of the, the recall performance you get out of inverted indices. And so what you'll see is on the bottom here, we have a graph where the blue line is traditional inverted indices. Um, I forget what data set this is to be frank, but um, trust me, the results hold. You have a blue line that uh, you know is just the result of traditional inverted indices. And then what we do is we assign it to another uh, four centroids and then eight centroids and 10 centroids. And really quickly, you can see a very large jump in the recall performance with this really simple trick of dealing with points on the boundary. Um, and then another, another small trick that we've been uh, playing with is called AD sampling. And the, the observation here is that a bulk of the time searching is spent rejecting candidates based on distance comparisons. And the idea is that um, when you actually look at the time spent, the majority of the time you're spending is spent rejecting candidates. So we have uh, graphs here of um, distance comparisons on negative operations in HNSW and IBF. You can see the bulk of the time these DCOs, distance compare operations, is spent on rejecting candidates. And the idea is that when you're actually sampling your graph, all you care about is, is the point I'm looking at 
further away from the closest from the you know the top of the stack of the closest points I've seen. Um, is it worth adding it to my top K list? And so what you can do is instead of having to do the full distance comparison, can we just compare a subset of the dimensions, right? And intuitively, like if you have a point in the Euclidean space and these two points are really far apart, you don't need to actually do the math for each dimension. At some point, the math for some subset of dimensions meets some threshold where you can just prune that, that point from your search entirely. Um, and so what they do in this paper is um, they use a result um, in high dimensional analysis known as the johnson linden strauss dilemma which lets you basically say that if you're going to take a point and apply some random Euclidean transformation to it, you can then prune that point from, you, you basically can bound the, um, the distance of that point, the norm of that point um, by some epsilon. And so they invent a hypothesis and they come up with a hypothesis testing procedure based on this bound um, from the johnson linden strauss lemma that lets them basically flexibly when they're doing their search, only compare a subset of the dimensions for any given point. And this ends up speeding the search up quite a bit. Um, and so our index combines uh, the, these, these two approaches. We divide the data into real-time and historical segments. We index real-time data into an HNSW graph. We compact historical data into inverted indices using the few tricks from the SPAN paper that I just mentioned to you, closure clustering, and a neighborhood graph, and flexible query sampling, or flexible query printing. And then when we query, we use AD sampling in order to reduce the overall distance computations required to do any one query. Um, we store the centroids in HNSW, and then we store our posting list separately and allow and using an inverted index approach while increasing the latency of our queries a little bit allows us to separate the storage and compute layers of our architecture. And this leads to a lot of benefits for both developer experience, um, but also just general operational flexibility. And so now I'll pass it off to Laquan to talk a little bit more about the core architecture and how the index uh, actually lives inside of the full distributed architecture. Yes, cool. I'm out of kink. Uh, yeah. I'll share my screen. I think before we go to that part, quick question, Hamad. That was excellent so far. This is re really great. Uh, uh, could you uh, shed a little light on how much you go into quantization? I know there was a slide you presented a uh, few slides back that said, in general, people do quantization. How aggressively do you use that uh, in your overall scheme? Or if you're going to answer that question later, you could defer it to. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So we actually don't use quantization at all. Uh, and the reason being that um, it, it is really hard to reason about the performance of your system when you use quantization. And so what people end up doing is they end up tuning the quantization scheme or the over query scheme to deal with the recall loss that you feel you face in quantization. Um, and the problem is if we were just running our own system, I think that would be easy for us to reason about, but because we have a lot of developers who are being exposed to these concepts for the first time, we've been in search for a solution that, that doesn't wow. leverage quantization. And so that's why we have these sort of other set of tricks that allows us to avoid um, having to quantize the data at the expense of some, at the expense of some latency, obviously. Thank you. Hi, a uh, quick question. Uh, Martin Promer from University of Wisconsin-Madison. So you mentioned a lot of talk about using the distance metrics. Have you looked into any of the alternative approaches where you specifically train a separate model to do all of your distance calculations, and then you rely on this distance measuring model instead of the, the more traditional approaches? Yeah, that's something that we've been interested in, but to be honest, have not spent that much time investigating. I'm personally also really curious about how those those approaches um, perform, but we haven't used them ourselves. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we can get started. Uh, thank you, Hamad, for the introduction of the uh, the problem, the workload, and the index we, we are trying to build. I think this is uh, one of the cornerstones of a uh, vector database and also like one of the cornerstones of the retrieval architecture for large, large, large language models. I think another cornerstone really the distributed protocols that we build in order to ensure the safety and the liveness properties of the system. And we'll talk about a few problems and the solution we propose to achieve safety and liveness. But before that, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly talk about the, the Chromos architecture, and I'll start with a single node. Uh, the single node of, of, of Chroma is pretty simple. It has a server 
content of front end and also metadata index and the vital index. And then when people send the nearest neighbor queries, they will first go to the metadata index and then query the vectors and then return the results. And there are a couple highlights of the single node like architecture. Um, currently we are using the the um, HNS, HNSW uh, as our index. And also we use a SQLite as our metadata index. And we also store the system level catalog. Uh, we, we call it system DB using SQLite. This is the single node version. In the distributed version, we basically decompose those components into separate services. For example, we'll have a coordinator that basically the system catalog, and we will introduce a front-end servers, which are kind of like the proxy, serving, uh, sending queries to the logs and the servers, depending on whether it's read or write. Um, we introduce a, a diffuse log as a database, and the diffuse log basically uh, serving the writes, and the row the writes will go to the distributed log first. And then the index node and query node will tell the distributed log and then build the views and the indexes uh, incrementally. And next, I'll talk about the read and the write paths for the chroma. So the write path will first go to log and the index node will tell those logs. And once it reaches a certain side threshold, it will flash to the object to the object storage like S3. And then that, that the write pass. The read pass will be like the front end servers will figure out the assignment of the uh, active segments and the hit our seg segments and the route the information to the right node. So we're using we're using a hashing scheme to reduce the global coordination. So basically the idea is that uh, basically distributed log like Kafka Composer have the concept of those like topics. And then based on the topic ID, we'll assign the topic to different nodes. And for the historic segments, it also has IDs and based on the uh, IDs, we'll assign them to, a, uh, to different nodes. Here I want to talk about a few like highlights of the system. Um, it, it's, it's very different, like uh, today compared to 10 days before ago, that there's a lot of ecosystem we can leverage to build distributed systems. For example, we can use object storage, we can use distributed logs, and we can also leverage Kubernetes to actually manage the membership and, uh, and, uh, and do notifications. So that is our one uh, principle. Basically, we want to leverage ecosystem whatever possible. However, I also want to build like critical capabilities like the uh, kind of information propagation protocols as well as like topic reconfiguration protocols to ensure that uh, the system has certain safety and aliveness property. And we highly leverage harsh in currently in our system to reduce global coordination. Um, yeah. Next, talk about one problem we are solving, uh, which is called, we call this routing information propagation. So in our write pass, basically, uh, we have like one active segment that tells the log, and then it increments the data, and then build indexes. And once it reaches a certain threshold, it becomes a historical segment. You can think about like all the segments are uh, generated from the active segment. And I, I think this is important for us to making sure that during the segment generation and splits, the front servers will always get the most up-to-date information so that the query will carry all the data for this collection so that we don't have like a data miss or have a partial query during this active segments split or node addition or node deletion. And the protocol we are building is, we, we build a monotonic protocol to ensure nodes query the correct data because from the server, because this is essentially a asynchronous system and uh, what 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 the indexing node does is that as it tail the data as it flash to the disk, it will register the membership 
to the coordinator. And the coordinator will broadcast the new term of IPEG uh, to the front server. The term is a class-wide term indicating a new assignment to the member list. And the term is only incremented in response to node additional removals. And IPEG is a per collection concept. It means that each time when we uh, split or when we generate a historical segment, the IPEG will be incremented. Because of the system asynchronous, the front-end server may receive the updated terms or epics in a delayed fashion, similar with the workers. Then how do we make sure that the system always carry the right information? And we basically has a, a pull and pu push, as well as a reconciliation rule. Pull means that when the new front-end servers, it will starts, you will pull the coordinator for the latest term and epic for certain collections. Push means that when there's a new membership or there's new uh, kind of like a segment generated, we'll push the updates to the old friend servers and the workers. The reconciliation means that all the queries will attach the term and epic observed by the worker. And then you will check whether the epic and term in the query is smaller or bigger or equal to the epic on the worker. If it's smaller, which means that the final servers are lagging behind and you need to query the coordinator to fetch the most up-to-date information. I think with pull, push, and reconciliation will guarantee um, the query always query the complete data for the collection in uh, asynchronous fashion. Yeah, this is one problem which I thought that the second problem that I think we're facing, as Haman mentioned, we are, we, are, we are dealing with a large number of collections. And also, even uh, we are using the Kafka browser, they have their own limitations on number of topics, mm -hmm. which means we cannot just simply assign one topic to a one collection of one topic. We have to use some sort of like a data multiplexing, meaning that we'll be assigned multiple collections to a set of topics. And then, but the challenge is that how do we make sure that as the system grows, as the number of collection grows, the we can reshard, re reconfigure the collections over topics. And this is in general a pretty challenging problem. And the problem is basically like, like that. During this reconfiguration, because the order of rights is very important because you don't want to you delete uh, to data show up again because of reordering. So you have to guarantee the orders of the rights, even in the chain, even in case of changing the num number of topics. And we have designed a protocol inspired by uh, the paper nine, basically to ensure that during the topic reshard or reconfiguration, the data observed by the indexing workers are ordered by the configuration and offset from the topics. And this is critical to ensure the correctness of the data and the user experience. And here's the high level view of the protocol. It actually basically solving two sub problems. One is a reconfiguration or reshard decision. And we use a coordinator to make the decision. And once the coordinator de decide we have to do a topic reconfiguration, it has to uh, be executed. This is similar as the prepare uh, like stage in the two phase commit protocol. And then the coordinator broadcasts a new topic list to the producer. And when the producer receives those like uh, new topic list and new configuration, it will communicate with uh, the consumers by writing a message called fin to the to the topics indicating that it will not produce messages with the previous configuration. And then the configuration, the consumers will buffer the messages. And then when it will receive the like uh, thin messages, it will know that which collections I will not receive the messages for the previous config configurations. And then I can deliver those messages to the index worker after I deliver the messages of the private of the current configuration for this collection. Here's some examples. 
uh, it's like two producers are responsible for two collections, and uh, as per, uh, and the, the in the configuration with there we have one topic, and both of the producers will pop, will, will produce to the old topic, and the consumer basically will consumer um, messages on this topic, and then we want to change this configuration to use two topics, and the protocol is like that. So the coordinator makes decisions and it broadcast to the configuration change to all the producers. And the, when the producer receive the messages, you send the, the thing to the other topic. For example, uh, let's say uh, producer one responds for collection one, and then once consumer receive the message from producer one, it knows that the collection one will no longer have messages for collection one with configuration with zero. This is very important. And then it can expose data to the index worker. And once it's received the producer two, the same message from producer two, then it can uh, expose the information for collection two. And this is uh, very important. And uh, we do have some, this is not going to work all the time, but we do need to have some like uh, uh, assumptions. Basically the assumption we need to make is that the consumer know how many producers are producing to this collection. And this cannot be changed during the configuration change. And the way we can do it is to disallow node addition and the node removal during the reconfiguration stage and also we can use some kind of like a static membership mechanism in case of like node crashes, we recover the state, the node in, into a state that is the same as before. In this case, we can make sure that um, the configuration during the, uh, we can have like a configuration change without any blocking of the, uh, of the producers and without blocking to the, uh, to the consumers. So this is like uh, a protocol we developer and we are going to verify with the TRE plus. So our our philosophy is basically like we think that because of distributed system all about reaching consensus and livenesses without with minimum I would say like synchronization between systems. So we need to make sure that those protocols are right from day one so that we don't run into situations that we have to do patch and patch again of the system of the protocol that is not pre-designed. So we will make sure that those information, those protocols are designed or are, are verified on day one with TLA plus so that we make sure that the protocols are very solid and then we'll be implementing them. The other thing we are, we are doing focusing on correctness is that even the single node chroma, we take a lot of like effort implementing the property based testing and the model based testing. And the idea is very simple is came from like uh, the lightweight, lightweight formal verifications uh, from AWS. And we basically have a model for the metadata and model for the data. And we have like reference implementations for example, like in memory map for the metadata and we have like a profile index in memory for the data. And then we compare, uh, we, we create a state machine that randomly prop like uh, prop, prop form operations, both on the reference implementation as well as the real implementation and then compare the result within certain bond. And we actually uh, did Quite, this is quite helpful in terms of improve our product capability and we fixed quite a few bugs with those uh, kind of like uh, property-based testing and model-based checking. And I think this also serve as a foundation when we build the different systems because we don't want our system to, you know, degrade quality or have, have like uh, uh, credit issues. And this is a solid foundation for us to move on. Okay, next up, I'm going to talk about roadmaps. And I think, as Herman mentioned, we want to be a end-to-end -end system for retrieval for language models. I think white search is only part of it and retrieval itself is not sufficient. So if you think about building application 
with uh, language models, there are three kind of like things you are thinking about, three components. The first one is really the logic or the chain of like prompts. The second one is the uh, data, including the retrieval as well as your structured data. And third thing that is very important is also like the feedback evaluation so that you can find the right strategy of chunking, embedding, kind of re-ranking so that you can have a right kind of like a, a, a production grade language model for your application. So this is come so with uh, Chromas like roadmap is we want to expand Chromas API to allow user defined function for chunking, embedding, indexing, and re-ranking. And also we allow more sophisticated retrieval strategies to be pushed down closer to the data. Right now, I think Chroma is focusing on the vector search part, but later we also want to um, uh, include the APIs of chunking, embedding, storage, and re-ranking. And uh, in the following slides, I'll talk about a few examples. And the first example will be retrieval evaluation. So you, you, you have some query and you have some retrieval result and also the generation result. And uh, there can be uh, some feedback around those results. And we can directly save those feedback into Chroma. And this feedback will be useful in many kind of use cases. Uh, it can be used to fine tune the embeddings and uh, different layers uh, and different steps. For example, these feedbacks can be used to fine tune the model. These feedbacks can be uh, fitted to the ad adapter met metrics, and we can also build re-ranking and filtering mechanism based on those feedback. And based on those feedback, uh, people can build better uh, uh, kind of like end-to-end uh, -end systems. Another thing Chroma is aiming to support with the pipeline API is uh, allow users or automatically generate the best uh, kind of chunking strategy. The chunking strategy is very important, but it's often overlooked. Uh, but however, the chunking is very important because it is actually tell the system what information they need to embed. And there are many historical chunking strategies based on the document structure. But however, what is the optimal chunking strategy depends a lot on the task and the data set. And I think Chroma is experimenting with the use of language models and the larger approaches to perform optimal chunking at data ingestion. And then based on those uh, uh, feedback and also um, we can, the Chroma can also include the re-ranking model as the end-to-end retrieval -end stack. And the relevance really uh, depends on the specific query or tasks as well as the underlying data site. So after we retrieve the data, I, I think we can allow users to experiment with different ranking models to generate the result that has the most relevant results. And that's all. Thank you. I will clap on behalf of uh, the audience. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. If the audience wants to go for it. I was wondering, connecting back to some of the discussion earlier on to uh, uh, Hamad, you had mentioned how the vector sizes that you use sometimes go up to 4K, and that's driven by the workload. Uh, could you and then Quan tell a little bit more about the diversity of the workloads that you see? Obviously, uh, people get those vectors probably by querying some other LLM or some other uh, method to do that. Is that what's driving it, or is there something else that's going on with the diversity that you see in the vector sizes? Yeah, I think it's mostly coming from the large variety of models that we're seeing in the open source landscape, um, and then also from multimodal. Um, so nowadays we're seeing like video embedding models that, for example, so the 4K embedding models that I mentioned are specifically video embedding models. And, and those just have 
by their nature a much higher dimensionality, but then they also have a temporal nature to them, which makes them uh, kind of difficult to reason about sometimes. So the first is just multimodal embeddings. And the second is there's a huge resurgence of open source embedding models. And so people are pulling them off the shelf. And these are often trained in uh, ways where it's a language model and then some part of it is removed and then fine tuned at the end, or it's, you know, a, a language, a, an embedding model trained specifically for this purpose. Um, and just the nature of the architecture leads to a much higher dimensionality. Now to say we, we have seen that you can reduce the dimensionality quite a bit and get the same performance. Um, so I do think there is a lot of headroom in dimensionality reduction when you have a specific task and domain in mind. And I think that's like very much in line with the kinds of problems that we want to solve because it doesn't make sense for you to have a embedding model that is, you know, generically good at all of human language if all you're trying to do is do code retrieval. Um, it makes sense for you to fine tune an embedding model down to a much smaller dimension um, and, and focus it on that very narrow task. So I think that that's kind of where things are going is we'll have these foundation embedding models that are trained on a wide corpus of data and people will fine tune them to their specific task and then that process can also do dimensionality reduction. And it's kind of silly sometimes how simple it is to do that dimensionality reduction. You, you really can just add a linear layer to the end of your embedding model and fine tune it down to a smaller dimension and get surprisingly good results with just simple binary classification as your training data set. Um, so, and that's what we end up seeing a lot of people do. Any, any other questions for the audience? Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry, two more questions. One is how big do some of these databases get in terms of number of vectors on some of the larger end applications that you see? Uh, and then I'll wait for the answer of asking the next one. Sure. Um, I think that the biggest data sets that we've seen are like right under a billion data points. Um, that's like the biggest data set that I've personally seen indexed into Chroma, but that's like very much on the tail case. So I think the large majority of our data is on the order of several hundreds of thousands to several millions of vectors. Um, but then again, the key part is that they're growing quite frequent, they're being updated quite frequently, both in terms of additions, but then also in terms of mutations, both updates and deletes. Um, and that leads to some challenges in the underlying vector index algorithm that you use. Um, but yeah, I think several millions of vectors seems to be where a lot of these things are converging. And I think that comes out from the fact that when you end up chunking a reasonable corpus of uh, documents, um, you know, say, say like 100 to 1000 documents, when you end up chunking them and then processing them, you end up somewhere in that regime. And so for most of the use cases that we're seeing, be it chat your documents, so you have some internal knowledge base that you want to chat over, or like code retrieval, or you know, um, augmenting a, a language model with knowledge specific about some new tool that you're developing so it can assist users with that task. Those corpuses of data tend to be um, not trivially small to where you can root force, but um, you know, not uh, insanely large where we have to start getting into how do we do billion scale vector search on a single node. Great. And then the follow-up question was, do you run into issues where someone has a long-standing application where they're not just creating these vector databases for a small amount of time, but they're really building on it, more like a database, and they go ahead and switch the model that they're using for embedding. Maybe they switch from GPT 3.5 to 4. Uh, do the users take care of migrating the database to this new embedded model, or do you provide tools to allow them to do that? Yeah, this is something that we've been thinking a lot about. We don't have any explicit tools to help with that today, but I think there's sort of three flavors of problems that all align with this. The first is the actual language model drifts over time without you knowing. So if you're using some API service provider, the behavior of the language model might change in and of itself without you even knowing, and that can be a bit strange to monitor for. So I think monitoring tools are something that the ecosystem is working on and, and perhaps might make sense for Chroma, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, and there's a really good paper actually from Databricks where they they measure like over three months, how does the performance of a language model on a fixed benchmark of tasks uh, change over time? Um, so I think that's the first um, class of problems. And the second class of problems is, as you mentioned it, like you change the embedding model uh, yourself and you have to sort of manage, um, you know, these different versions of the same task workflow that you're, that you're trying to perform. And I think that in that case, the way that we think about it is people are going to be doing that both in, uh, you know, for experimentation, but then also for valid use cases where maybe it makes sense to online A-B test uh, two different embedding models and, and perform, uh, you know, a comparison and then see which one's performing better. Uh, maybe you fine tune something and you want to run an experiment. So I think in that case, um, we do think that there needs to be a way to, for the system itself to handle that for you. And I think that's sort of an experimentation 
a platform that could live inside of, uh, of Chroma, but then also, of course, you could just do that on your own using the same data model. And I think the way that ends up manifesting is the fundamental data structure or, or like data model of Chroma is a collection of data and you just create multiple. And then the idea is like, how can we somehow allow those to share indices to start, but then if you mutate them or change them over time, um, can you know do some sort of copy on write scheme. Um, so I think that that's that's one potential approach is you don't need to do, you don't need to duplicate all the data just the data that matters for your specific variation, um, and then I think the the third class of problems that people run into is they um, they you know are changing other strategies so they're not changing the embedding model but perhaps they like are changing the actual uh, you know fight that they're changing the chunking strategy or they're changing the re-ranking strategy or they're actually just updating a document so a huge problem we see is like I took this document I broke it into ten chunks. Then I actually update the source document. What's like the best way to you know update all the individual chunks of the document without having to redo all the processing that I just did and waste a bunch of compute in the case of very large documents? Um, so how, how do we do like a different embed is like an active problem. So I think those are sort of the three areas where we see some sort of drift in either embedding model providers or you know, language model providers um, resulting in issues or actual just drift from the person using the database themselves potentially causing issues. And I, and I do think that it's necessary that whatever system emerges to solve these problems, hopefully Chroma makes those things easy for you. Yeah, thank you. And I just loved how you had so many connections made to papers and it was just fantastic. Loved it. Uh, awesome talk. All right, any other questions with the audience? So I wanted to go back to the sort of the distributed consensus protocol you're running to do the reconfiguration. Is this something specific to Chroma or is this like a, just a limitation in Kafka that like you do this reconfiguration and you need to update a bunch of people that are feeding from it in a sort of atomic manner? Yeah, like, this I, is I, like, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, this is a limitation from Kafka. I think there was a proposal about like uh, topic expansions uh, in Kafka, probably in Pulse as well. But this is in general a pretty hard problem in the sense that you need to coordinate uh, the producer, the broker, the consumer. So I, I think this is like uh, how we have to uh, build on top of limitations part of the Kafka. I think the, 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 the I think the, I, on a high level, the intuition is that uh, Assuming that you are dealing with even time processing with out of order like messages, and the message you can arrive uh, kind of like in a, in a fashion that can be delayed, but you want to make sure that, for example, you want to compute the number of like the spend on an hourly basis, and then the hourly basis can really like arrive late, maybe in twenty four hours late. You basically need to keep all the windows open before you can um, send the right answer to the downstream, right? Uh, this is how this is basically the paradigm of Flink or like Spark streaming. But in none the idea is that you always output the correct answer to the downstream. And the way to do it is to, to figure out uh, what they call our frontiers, which is the latest or the lower bound of even timestamp that will happen in the future. And once you know the like uh, the frontier, then everything be before this timestamp is kind of like you already know the answer and you're not, you're not go, going to change everything you send out to the downstream will, will, not, will be irrevocable. The idea is that this is basically a high level idea and the way we do it is to make sure that we know all the producers are producing this, this collection and we know that all the, um, we need to keep track of how many producers already make the configuring change and then the producer once they are absolutely sure that they have received all the kind of acknowledgement from producers that we are no longer producing the data before, then I can safely uh, send in data to the downstream without violating any like ordering guarantees. Yeah. That is how, I, mean, how, I mean, how expensive would a stop the world be in this, like to do this reconfiguration? In, in this case, if I, I think there's, um, there won't be any big like, uh, stop the world. The first step you need to know because we probably will use two code paths for the normal case as well as the reconfiguration case. I think the only thing you need to like two stage consensus is we need to make sure that everyone is entering, is make sure that we are executing a configuring change and then we switch to the uh, configuration change code paths. It's similar right. as, a, yeah, that, that is only, after that, 
everything is asynchronous. If you make sure that there's no uh, like uh, uh, no additional removal or crashes, yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that's then, another um, idea. Yeah. And then, and then at the beginning of the talk, you guys went through a bunch of different optimizations that Jignesh said. We, we you know, appreciate you guys putting citations to the papers. Um, but like, you didn't show, is, is it possible to show like for all those optimizations, like which one gave the, the most bang for the buck in terms of engineering or com even compute time? Like if someone's going to implement all those optimizations, which one should they start with first? Yeah, I think the, the biggest one is if you're doing inverted indices, the closure clustering, with the, what they call closure clustering in the span paper, where you assign a point to multiple centroids based on a battery condition, um, that that changes inverted indices from something that is very hard to reason about the performance of, to basically working almost as good as HNSW in most cases. Um, it was quite surprising to us when we implemented it. It's like a very simple idea, like you have points on the boundary just assign mm -hmm. them to multiple centroids, very simple heuristic, but it, it changes the recall performance by like 20 to 30% in some cases. Um, and it's, it's quite a large and, and drastic jump.